Hello and welcome to another complete Cambridge IGCSE biology lesson. In this one will be breaking down paper 63, one of the alternative to practical papers from the 2023 October-November exam series. Now I understand that every paper is different, but given that they're all structured in the same way and ask the same kind of questions, I still consider practicing past papers by far the best way to prepare. Now before we begin, I have a couple of things to mention. Number one, this video is relevant whether you've been entered for paper 5 or 6, since both papers are essentially the same, at least in terms of where the marks come from. Number 2. All the experimental contexts that come up in papers 5 and 6 are covered in my content videos and resources. I'll put links to the topics that relate to this specific paper in the description. Number 3. I'm currently working on a video covering the most common multiple choice questions for each of the 21 chapters, so if that's something you might benefit from, be sure to subscribe. Finally, if you have any questions, leave a comment down below and I'll do my best to respond. Okay, let's begin. So flour and yeast are used to make bread dough as shown in figure 1.1. Respiration in yeast produces carbon dioxide gas bubbles that make the bread dough increase in volume. A student used bread dough to investigate the effect of temperature on the rate of respiration in yeast and they used the following method. So they placed three test tubes labeled C, R and H into a test tube rack and added 10 cubic centimeters of water to each. They then placed the different test tubes tubes in different water baths, one at 5 degrees, one at 20 degrees and one at 40 degrees, and left them for five minutes. They then labelled three transparent cups, C, R and H, so corresponding to the three test tubes, and added flour and yeast mixture to each cup up to a height of approximately one centimetre. They then poured the water from test tubes C, R and H into cups C, R and H and stirred each with a glass rod to form a dough. So we have a dough made from cold water, one made with room temperature water and one with warm water. They then drew a line on each cup to mark the position of the top of the dough as shown in figure 1.2, left the cups for 20 minutes to allow the yeast to get to work and finally drew a second line on each cup to mark the new position of the top of the dough. Now at this point it should already be evident what the experiment is about and the results we should expect to find. We are varying temperature and measuring how far the dough rises, which is of course indicative of rate of respiration in yeast. In your exam, make sure to take your time here and really understand the experiment before diving in to the questions. So the first thing that you need to do is to draw a line on each cup in figure 1.3 to show the new position of the top of the dough. Now if we look back to the previous diagram we can see that the line drawn would make contact with the highest point of the dough if extended out so we need to make sure that our lines are drawn in the same way. Next measure the change in the height of the dough in each cup in figure 1.3 which can just be done with a ruler and then prepare a table and record these measurements in your table. So we're going to get one mark for drawing a table with two columns and a header line, one for adding appropriate column headings with units if applicable, and then one mark for actually recording your measurements. Next, you need to state a conclusion for these results. So what can we conclude from our observations? Well, at higher temperatures, the dough rose more, which means more carbon dioxide was being produced. So we can conclude, given that carbon dioxide is a byproduct of respiration in yeast, that as temperature increases, the rate of respiration increases. Next, you need to state the independent variable in the investigation. The independent variable in any investigation is the variable that you manipulate, control or vary in order to explore its effects. So in this case, the independent variable, the thing we're manipulating, is temperature. Then identify one possible source of error with the method used to measure the dependent variable. So the dependent variable is the variable that changes as a result of us manipulating the independent variable. So in other words, it's the outcome that we're interested in measuring, in this case, dough height. So what's one possible source of error associated with measuring dough height? Well, the dough was obviously not flat. It was rounded, it wasn't smooth. And this meant that we weren't getting a truly accurate measure of change in dough volume. Next, state a piece of laboratory equipment that could be used to improve the method in step 
8. So step 8 involved spooning the flour and yeast mixture into the three cups to a height of approximately one centimeter. So for this one we could have used an electric balance to ensure that the mass of dry ingredients was the same in each cup, or a measuring cylinder, which would have allowed us to more accurately measure the height of the ingredients. Next, explain why test tubes C, R and H were kept in the water baths for five minutes in step six. And this one is simply to allow the temperature of the water in the test tubes to become the same as the temperature of the water baths, or in other words, to equilibrate the water. Now, don't worry about your wording too much for questions like these, as long as the point you're trying to get across is clear. Next, the investigation was done by another student using three cups which had different diameters, as shown in figure 1.4. Explain why using different sized cups caused an error in the results. So what's the issue with using cups of different diameters? Well, the point I've made here is that an equal increase in dough volume would result in a different increase in dough height in each of the three cups. We could have also said that the initial volume of the dough is different in each cup, as the initial height of dry ingredients, one centimeter, was the same in each. So far more dry ingredients in the wide cup than the narrow. We could have also mentioned that the proportion of water to flour and yeast differs between cups, as only 10 cubic centimetres of water is added in each case, or that there are two independent variables, two things we're actively changing in the experiment, temperature and cup size. Next, yeast uses the reducing sugar glucose for respiration. This reaction produces carbon dioxide. A sample of flour was tested for reducing sugars using the Benedict's test which we covered in chapter 4 on biological molecules. State the result of a positive test. So Benedict's solution will change from blue to green or yellow, or blue to brick red, depending on the concentration of reducing sugars in the substance being tested. Flour is obviously high in carbohydrate, so we'd expect to see the solution turn red. Identify a hazard when doing the Benedict's test. Well, the test involves heating the mixture of the Benedict's solution and the test substance, so we could have put getting burned or scalded when heating the reagent. However, I've put that Benedict's is irritant and corrosive. Part three is to state the name of a reagent that can be used to test for carbon dioxide. So this was covered in chapter six on plant nutrition and chapter 11 on gas exchange in humans, links below. The reagents used were hydrogen carbonate indicator solution, which turns yellow as carbon dioxide levels rise, and lime water, which turns cloudy. Salt is usually added to the flour and yeast mixture when making bread for taste reasons, but it can reduce the rate of respiration in yeast. The effect of salt concentration on the volume of carbon dioxide gas produced by yeast is shown in the table 1.1. You need to calculate the percentage change in the volume of carbon dioxide gas produced from a salt concentration of 0 grams per cubic decimeter to 10 grams per cubic decimeter. Give your answer to one decimal place and show you're working. So calculate the percentage change in carbon dioxide from 0 grams to 10 grams of salt. We have 5.3 cubic centimeters of carbon dioxide produced per minute at 0 grams of salt and 0.3 cubic centimeters at 10 grams of salt. So first work out the change in gas produced, the second value minus the first, 0.5 minus 5.3, that's minus 5 cubic centimeters per minute and then divide by the initial value and multiply by 100 to work out a percentage. The answer is minus 94.3396 minus 94.3 when rounded to one decimal place. Now on to part C. Humans can use the energy released during respiration to exercise. Plan an investigation to determine the effect of exercising at different intensities on breathing rate. So how to plan an investigation? Well, the first mark's going to come from stating the independent variable, the variable that you will be manipulating and observing the effects of. The independent variable of this investigation is exercise intensity. Participants will walk or run on a treadmill for two minutes at five kilometers an hour, seven kilometers an hour, and nine kilometers an hour. They will be given five minutes of rest between each bout of exercise. So here I'm stating my independent variable and then being specific about how I'm going to change it. 
The second mark comes from stating the dependent variable, which in this case is breathing rate, which I will measure immediately after exercise by counting the number of breaths participants take in one minute. I will use a stop clock. Next, two marks for mentioning two control variables or things that you need to keep constant during your investigation. So control variables here include exercise duration, rest duration, treadmill gradient, temperature and humidity. Now you're also going to get a mark for stating that you'll repeat the investigation. This is important as it will help you to identify any anomalous results. Finally, you'll get a mark for drawing attention to safety precautions. So for this experiment, I've said that for safety reasons I will ensure that participants warm up thoroughly and check that they're wearing appropriate footwear. Now finally there are marks available for detailing the method of the investigation which I've already done when talking about the independent and dependent variables. So I get one mark for describing the method of changing exercise intensity that is running at different speeds and one for describing the type of exercise and equipment used. So I've made reference to the use of a treadmill and a stop clock for measuring breathing rate. Now on to question two, another really common type of question. So figure 2.1 is a photomicrograph of two guard cells in the lower epidermis of a leaf. Make a large drawing of the two guard cells and the two complete epidermal cells shown in figure 2.1. So a few things to take note of when drawing a diagram. Number one, the outline is a single clear line with no shading. Number two, your drawing should occupy the majority of the space available. And number three, the different components of the diagram should be proportionate. For example, here the guard cells should clearly be much smaller than the epidermal cells. So you'll get one mark for drawing an outline, a single clear line with no shading, and one mark for making sure that the guard cells are at least 31 millimeters in length. That's the length of line PQ and is why you must use the majority of the space provided. You'll also get one for drawing the four nuclei, two circular and two in the guard cells that are longer than they are wide. And finally, for drawing two epidermal cells that are touching each other and touching two guard cells each. So this one is just about the detail of your drawing and how accurately it represents the original. Next question, line PQ represents the length of the guard cells in figure 2.1. Measure the length of line PQ in figure 2.1. So for this one, you'll use a ruler, and the answer is 31 millimeters plus or minus one millimeter each way. So you need to be pretty accurate, but not absolutely perfect. You then need to calculate the actual length of the guard cells using your formula and your measurement, and give your answer to two significant figures. So given that we've been asked to calculate actual length of the guard cells, which is on the bottom of the equation, we need to start by rearranging the equation to actual length equals length of line PQ divided by magnification. You're going to get one mark for correctly measuring the line, which we've already done, one for correctly calculating the actual length of the guard cells, which is 31 divided by 1650, that's the magnification given in the diagram above, and one for rounding to two significant figures. So our final answer is 0.019 millimeters. Okay, now on to part B, which is on transpiration, topic 8. So transpiration is the loss of water vapour from the leaves of a plant. A student used a potometer to investigate the effect of wind speed on transpiration. Figure 2.2 shows part of the apparatus used. The air bubble in the tubing will move towards the leafy shoot because water moves into the stem when water is lost from the leaves. The student used the following method. Cut a leafy shoot from a plant, place the leafy shoot into the potometer, measure the distance the air bubble moves moves in five minutes at different wind speeds, maintain the temperature in the room at 25 degrees and the relative humidity at 60 degrees, and then repeat the investigation using five different leafy shoots, and each shoot must have the same number of leaves. Now what is the dependent variable in this investigation, the thing being measured? That is the distance the air bubble moved in five minutes. Next, state two factors that were kept constant in the investigation described. So there are several we can choose from here. We could have gone for number of leaves, time measured, temperature, humidity, or using the same potometer. Just make sure in your exam you read the questions carefully. All the information you need will be provided. 
Next, suggest the purpose of the petroleum jelly shown in figure 2.2. So petroleum jelly has been placed around the stem. Given that we're measuring water loss from the leaves, it's fairly obvious that this is to prevent any additional water loss from around the stem. Next, explain why the student repeated the investigation. As I've already mentioned, repeats are important as they help us to identify anomalous results. Now the results of this experiment are shown in table 2.1. Plot a line graph on the grid of the data in table 2.1. When drawing graphs, you need to A, label the axes with units to match the table headers. So in this case, wind speed in kilometers an hour are independent variable on the x-axis and distance moved in five minutes in millimeters, the dependent variable on the y-axis. B, you need to make sure that you use a suitable scale and that your graph occupies at least half of the grid in both directions. C. Accurately plot your points and they give you a margin of error of plus or minus half a small square. And D. Draw a suitable line connecting the points. Okay, final question for this paper is using your graph, estimate the distance the air bubble moved in five minutes when the wind speed was 15 kilometers per hour and show on your graph how you obtained your estimate. So one mark for providing an estimate in millimeters and one for indicating on the graph as to where the reading was taken from. So for 15 kilometers an hour, draw a line halfway between 10 and 20 on the x-axis and where it intersects with our line is where we take our estimate from. Okay, well done. That was everything for this IGCSE Biology Paper 6 breakdown. Leave a thumbs up if you benefited from this video and remember to subscribe if you want to be notified as soon as I upload the next one.